normal. Hanging out with friends. Hugs. Traffic. Normal. But then, things changed. Now we see normal differently. We interact differently. We learn differently. We experience God differently. The new normal. Good morning, Clear Branch. Guys, I can't tell you how good it is to be with you this morning. It feels like it's been a while. I mean, I know that I've been here with you on Sunday mornings, but it's been a while since I stood on the podium and I brought you a message, and so I'm grateful for that opportunity. And, and certainly, we continue to, to keep Vaughn in our thoughts as he is in our prayers, as he is in uh, Kentucky and he's working on his doctoral work. We probably ought to keep Cindy and the kids in our prayers too. I mean, you know, we all know that he's the one who holds it down around there. He keeps it all moving in the right that's actually Cindy. That Cindy, Cindy does most of that. But she's got it together in his absence. But we still want to lift him in prayer as he is in the midst of studying and he is in the midst of working on some, some tough stuff in that doctoral program. I cannot imagine. Uh, but uh, certainly grateful that he has that opportunity to be there. But selfishly grateful that I have time to be with you guys. I hope you guys are good with that. <laughs> so I want to take you guys on a little trip. We're going to go back to the, the summer of 1982. And I know some of you guys are thinking, golly, 1982, you know exactly where you were. Others of you were not born yet, right? I I happen to have been almost four years old. Uh, It was late summer. I had spent that summer at the pool every single day with my mother. That was what she loved to do. We'd go up in the morning. My dad would eat breakfast with us. He would get dressed and hop in the car and he would go to work. And mom and I would load up and we would go to the swimming pool at Arrowhead Country Club in Montgomery, Alabama. And we would stay there from about the time that the pool opened until they kicked us out. And it was a blessing in so many ways because... Over the course of of the years leading to that point, I had kind of grown up as a water baby. From the minute that I was able to even go to the pool, my mom was taking me and getting in the water with me and working with me. And so by the age of three, I was swimming pretty good. And if I was in the shallow wind, I could could do whatever I wanted to do. I could kind of hop along and do my thing. I, I could stay by the stairs and play with my toys. I could swim a little bit, and mom was perfectly comfortable with that. But if I began to venture towards the the deep end of the pool, she would say, Jeremy, you know, come back. Don't go that way. Well, early in the summer, I had learned that that I had the ability, strikingly enough, even as a a three and a half year old, to to convince my parents that I was ready to jump off of the the, the little one meter diving board. It was a springboard and I would would get up on the end and I'd climb the stairs and I'd run off like it was the, the most important thing in the world and I'd land in the water and I'd swim to the side. I was pretty proud of myself. But over the course of that summer, I watched these older kids who would climb the the 12-foot diving board. And I would look up at it in awe and I would see them run off the end or dive off the end or do flips or whatever it was that they did. And I was just amazed. And so over the course of that summer, I asked probably a thousand times if I could go and climb the high dive and jump off. And, And my mother would regularly tell me, oh, sweetie, Um, you can swim pretty good in the shallow end and and you do pretty good off the the low diving board, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. By the end of the summer, I think I'd worn her down as kids have a tendency to do, right? You ask enough times, parents are eventually going to say, go for it, have fun. Don't use that, kids. By the way, I didn't just tell you that. That's a bad idea. Don't don't use that. But I did it. And I I, I went and I climbed up that, that giant ladder and I got to the top and I held on to those steel uh, you know kind of boundaries I had these like uh, arm rails to make sure you didn't fall off on the concrete and 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 I'm standing there at the top of the ladder and I'm looking out at the pool in front of me and I realized very very quickly that a 12 foot diving board is way higher than a, a one meter diving board 
And I wasn't exactly sure what I was going to do. And I was faced with the opportunity, the, the option of climbing back down the ladder, which was already completely teeming with other children who were bigger than me that wanted to jump. Or the alternative was that I could kind of get myself together, pull my floaties up on my arms, and I could walk off the end of that diving board. Now we'll get to what happened in a few minutes. But it's that in-between place that sometimes can be the most terrifying. Because we build ourselves up to get up the ladder. Sometimes when we reach the precipice, the only thing that we want to do is find the safest, easiest, least uh, difficult way for us to get back down. Even if that means sacrificing our own uh, ability to be proud of ourselves. Sacrificing the hope and the expectation that we're going to be able to complete these things. And being embarrassed by the climb back down the ladder. And so today in our new normal series, I want to take you guys into a place in Scripture that evidences somebody who I believe, though diving boards may not have existed at this point, found himself at a precipice and he had the opportunity to either choose to go back the way he had come or to take the steps forward as he moved in faith. And the person that we'll be discussing today is a man by the name of Nicodemus. And the Scripture that we'll begin with is John 7, 45 to 52. Why don't you guys stand for the reading of the word? John 7, 45 to 52 says this. The officers then came to the chief priests and Pharisees who said to them, why did you not bring him? The officers answered, no one ever spoke like this man. The Pharisees answered them, have you also been deceived? Have any of the authorities of the Pharisees believed in him? But this crowd that does not know the law is accursed. Nicodemus, who had gone to him before, who was one of them, said to them, Does our law judge a man without first giving him a hearing and learning what he does? And they replied, Are you from Galilee too? Search and see that no prophet arises from Galilee. And this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You guys have a seat. I know we're starting in the middle of this story. If you know much about Nicodemus, you know that he makes his first entrance in John chapter 3. And when he shows up in John chapter 3, he's, he's moved into a place where he wants to ask Jesus some questions. But in starting in chapter 7, we have the unique ability to kind of consider where that in-between might be for Nicodemus. In this moment, Nicodemus stands before a people that are considered to be the leaders, the teachers, the most significant within the expectation and provision of the law for the people of God. And Nicodemus standing there before them begins to ask questions that, that, are, that are perhaps a little con- contradictory to what they expected and what they wanted. He, he posits this saying, does our law judge a man without first giving him and hearing and learning what he does? Nicodemus in this moment is beginning to take some tentative steps. I would suggest that this is Nicodemus at the top of the diving board. And sometimes, as I mentioned a minute ago, being at the top of the diving board can be the most terrifying place for us to be. Because we've already made the journey up, but we haven't yet quite figured out how we're going to get down. And Nicodemus, in this instance, looks at those people that he is considered to be a leader among, and he says to them, do we not need to treat this man fairly? Do we not need to give him the same respect that we would give each other or another who is in a situation where they're teaching. We should be seeking knowledge and information from him so that we can understand who he is and what he's all about. And yet the other leaders, the Pharisees, instead of being interested in learning about Jesus, immediately began to respond in a way that evidences that they felt threatened. They wanted to find out in that moment something that they could use against Jesus. And we know that that becomes their MO throughout the rest of Scripture. We know that they spend a lot of time attempting to put something together so that they can put Jesus on trial, so that ultimately they can hold him responsible. They can save themselves from the potential of what comes next, right? They're so content in where they have been in their lives that they are unable to change and see where it is that Jesus is leading them. 
And if I may suggest right now in the midst of where we are in this world that seems all too different from where we have been, we find ourselves in a similar situation. We have the opportunity for longing about what was or we have the opportunity to faithfully move towards what God calls us to. And maybe that doesn't mean that you're standing on a high dive. Maybe it doesn't mean that you're sitting between the Pharisees and the Sadducees and you're having a discussion about who this Jesus is. But in your life, maybe what you're dealing with is getting to the point where you can say, yes, things are different, but God is still God. I got to be honest with you. When this idea, this series was first presented and the, and the topic name was New Normal, I was angry. I was frustrated because I thought, man, I don't want this, 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 this continuation of fearfulness. I don't want us to have to exist in this in-between place. And then in the midst of preparing for this series, in the midst of providing what I was doing to come and speak with you guys this morning, I came to the realization that we could call it whatever we want to, but the simple truth is that we are in these wilderness places in our lives at times, and it is in those places that God refines us. That God transforms us, that God brings us to a new place, that he gives us a new opportunity, and that he challenges us to walk in faithfulness because he is faithful. And so as we think about where Nicodemus is, we question what it may be like to stand on that diving board. Let's jump back to chapter 3. Let's look back down the ladder for a minute. In John 3, 5 through 12, Jesus answered saying this, Truly, truly, I say to you, Unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. And Nicodemus says to him, how can these things be? And Jesus answered him, are you the teacher of Israel and yet you do not understand these things? Truly I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? Just a few chapters before where we were a second ago, in in seven, we wind up finding Nicodemus face to face with Jesus, face to face with the man that the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the leaders of the people are beginning to question. They're beginning to wonder about. And rather than do that in isolation, rather than do that on his own, rather than do that in the midst of people with these questions, Nicodemus takes the questions to the person of whom they're wondering about. And he goes at night and he sits down with Jesus and he says, hey, listen, we know that you're a teacher, but help me to understand what you're all about. And Jesus begins to present a story to him about it's not only a life uh, of, of, of being connected to the law, because that's really what Nicodemus was all about. He was so set, as were most other Israelites at the time, in the, in the power and the presence of the law. And Jesus says, listen, it's about being born again, and it's about being born of the water and of the Spirit, and it's about coming to a place where you recognize that you don't have to have all the answers, because your God has all the answers. And I don't know about you, but there are moments where I am right now in this day where I need to remember that our God knows where we're going even if we can't see the path. That our God is not concerned about this wilderness place that we find ourselves. That our God is not worried about our life at the top of the diving board as we look down and see what's behind us and look forward and we see a pool full of water. Our God is not overwhelmed and yet somehow we are. Our God is with us every step of the way. He was with us as we climbed up the ladder and he's with us as we're hanging on for dear life to the railing at the top and he's going to be with us as we make those tentative steps towards the end and he is with us as we jump and as we land in the water and he is with us as we swim to the side and we get out and we do it again because in those moments we find out that sometimes the leaps of faith are the most exciting You see, we have an opportunity where we are in this moment to either be fearful about what we've lost or to be expectant about what God promises. 
And our God did not bring us to this place so that he could abandon us. Our God did not bring us to this place so that we would be uncertain. Our God did not bring us to this place so that we would falter. Our God brought us to this place so that we can walk in faithfulness. So how you doing? Are you walking faithfully? Or are you walking fearfully? Are you looking forward to what's ahead with the expectation that no matter what it may be, that God is not only with you, but that God is establishing your steps and he is calling you to the finish line? Or are you looking at your situation and all you can do is think, "Uh uh-oh. I'll be honest, I've spent some time in that place where I felt like I was saying, "Uh uh-oh, more than I was saying, let's go. And God is calling us to get a move on. And he's challenging us. Just as Jesus challenged Nicodemus to to take steps and to recognize that though he he can't understand these earthly things, that that he's intended to strive for that, not as on his cord, but as a work of the Spirit within him. And he's intended to wrestle with this stuff. And what I believe we find as we kind of make that move back in the direction that time usually flows from three to seven is that Nicodemus is beginning to understand that this Jesus who he has encountered is not... Someone who is uncertain is not someone who doesn't have a plan and does not know, but rather who is someone who is worthy of defense, and that's what he does. But it moves beyond that defense process. In fact, as you look at John 19, 38 to 39, this is what it says. As we move forward and we make progress, after these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him permission, so he came and he took away the body. Here it is. Nicodemus also, who earlier had come to Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds in weight. This man who had been in an in-between, this man who had not really understood the fullness of who Jesus was, this man who wrestled with what was behind and what it was like to leave those things and who wondered what was ahead and what it was like to step out into that faithfully, now has come. And he's brought an enormous amount of aloe and myrrh, which, by the way, is hundreds of thousands of dollars of value 2,000 years ago. And he brings it so that he can play a part in the preparation of the body of Jesus. And I'll be honest with you, there's people who argue whether or not this is evidence of a transition in the heart of Nicodemus. I'm going to tell you right now that if I spend $300,000 on something, I'm not doing it because I don't believe. I'm not doing it on a whim. I'm not doing it because I'm trying to be a nice guy. I'm doing it because there is value and worth. I'm doing it because I'm fully bought in and fully invested in what it is that I'm putting my money into. By the way, I do not have $300,000 in the bank. Okay. If I did, I would hope that I could walk in faith as Nicodemus does. And Nicodemus is responding in a way that evidences whether we see it fully or not, whether we get the entire story or not, we see in this moment that he has gotten to the end of the diving board, ladies and gentlemen, and that he has jumped off. That he has moved beyond fear and he is taking steps in faithfulness, that he has gotten beyond what used to be and he has begun to strive towards what will be. And you see, that's where we are right now because we can either continue to live in that fearful expectation, we continue to live in what was, or we can truly begin to have faith that our God is carrying us to something that is greater, even if we can't fully see it. And my hope and my challenge and my desire is that each and every one of us will walk faithfully, that each and every one of us will take steps, that each and every one of us that will remember that, will get, that God is with us, that he always has been, and that he always will be, and that in that, we'll shed that fear. We'll leave behind the things of yesterday and step fully into the things of tomorrow. Because let me let you in on a little secret. The God through Christ that was present with Nicodemus in the book of John is the God through Christ and the Holy Spirit that is present with us right now. And he is no less unsure about what he is doing because he knows where he's going and what the plan is today than he was then. He absolutely has an understanding of things. And 
He is as certain as you could ever be about what is to come. And yet somehow we wind up floundering in the middle. And I think the thing that begins to become the tipping point for us, if you want to get down to the brass tacks of it, is this. See, I told you guys the story of climbing the diamond board, of, of, of walking across the top, of, of preparing to jump off, of, of the fearfulness that was there. Ultimately, that summer, as a three and three-quarter year old, I learned how to jump off the 12-foot diving board. And it really wasn't about the fact that I had on some fancy floaties or that I tied up my swimsuit extra tight because I didn't want it to fall off when I jumped in, right? It wasn't the security that I could generate on my own that gave me the opportunity to do that. Do you know what made the difference between me climbing down that diving board ladder and me jumping off the end of it? The fact that the day that it happened for the first time, my father had waded out into the deep end and he was waiting on me to jump. And as I walked up to that edge and I looked down at that water, I didn't simply see the depth of the water before me. I saw the, the father that had walked with me to that point and who would walk with me for years more. And he had his arms up and he said, come on, son, jump. You can do it. That's what our God's doing right now. He says, guys, I know you're scared. Listen, I know it's uncertain. I realize that the diving board's high. I realize that, that this pandemic is scary. I know that the things that are happening around this world seem uncertain. And yet, you have to be willing to jump because I'm here to catch you. Our God is calling us to faithfulness. And he's calling us to fearlessness. And he's right there to catch us. Thanks be to God. May we walk faithfully and fearlessly. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for your love and your grace. We thank you for your patience. We thank you for your work among us. And Father, we thank you that you know the end. We thank you that you are certain that you are unfailing and we thank you that you call us to similarly walk in faith. Father, help us to move beyond those uncertainties of our life and step into the places that may seem uncomfortable but that give us an opportunity to more fully rely on you. And in that, Father, grant us a discernment to know where it is that you lead and the faithfulness to remember that no matter where it is, that you are God and that we are not. Grant us the willingness and the strength and the courage to take steps forward when sometimes all we want to do is climb back down the ladder. And remind us fully that you are not only with us in the moment, but that you are with us every moment. Empower us, Lord, to be bold people that boldly proclaim your goodness and your grace to a world that needs to hear it. Allow us to be faithful people that evidence all that you are as we strive to live every day for all that you've called us to be. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.